Hi, welcome to another Biomedical Engineers TV video. In this video, we will look into lithotripsy machine. First, let's look into the history of lithotripsy. French surgeon and urologist Jean Chiviel in 1832 invented a surgical instrument, the lithotrite, to crush stones inside the bladder without having to open the abdomen. To remove a calculus, Chiviel inserted his instrument through the urethra and bored holes in the stone. Afterwards, he crushed it with the same instrument and aspirated the resulting fragments or let them flow normally with urine. Lithotripsy replaced lithotrites as the most common treatment beginning in the mid-1980s. In extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, ESWL, external shockwaves are focused at the stone to pulverize it. ESWL was first used on kidney stones in 1980, and it is also applied to gallstones and pancreatic stones. External shockwaves are focused and pulverize the stone which is located by imaging. The first shockwave lithotriptor approved for human use was the Dornier Human Model 3, derived from a device used for testing aerospace parts. Second generation devices used piezoelectricity or electromagnetism generators. American Urological Association guidelines consider ESWL a potential primary treatment for stones between 4 mm and 2 cm. Let's look into the components of a lithotripsy machine. All lithotripsy machines share four basic components. One, a shockwave generator. Two, a focusing system. Three, a coupling mechanism. And four, an imaging localization unit. Let's know about the shockwave generator. Shockwaves can be generated in one of three ways. First is electrohydraulic. The original method of shockwave generation used in the Dornier HM3 was electrohydraulic, meaning that the shockwave is produced by a spark gap technology. In an electrohydraulic generator, a high voltage electrical current passes through a spark gap electrode located within a water filled container. The discharge of energy produces a vaporization bubble which expands and immediately collapses, thus generating a high energy pressure wave. The second type is piezoelectric. The piezoelectric effect produces electricity via application of mechanical stress. The Curie brothers first demonstrated this in 1880. The following year, Gabriel Lippmann theorized the reversibility of this effect, which was later confirmed by the Curie brothers. The piezoelectric generator takes advantage of this effect. Piezoelectric ceramics or crystals set in a water-filled container are stimulated via high-frequency electrical pulses. The alternating stress and strain changes in the material create ultrasonic vibrations, resulting in the production of a shockwave. And the third type of shockwave generator is electromagnetic. In an electromagnetic generator as seen below, a high voltage is applied to an electromagnetic coil similar to the effect in a stereo loudspeaker. This coil, either directly or via a secondary coil, induces high frequency vibration in an adjacent metallic membrane. This vibration is then transferred to a wave propagating medium, i.e. water, to produce shock waves. Let's look into the focusing system. The focusing system is used to direct the generator-produced shock waves at a focal volume in a synchronous fashion. The basic geometric principle used in most lithotriptors is that of an ellipse. Shock waves are created at one focal point, F1, and converge at the second focal point, F2. The target zone, or blast path, is the three-dimensional area at F2, where the shock waves are concentrated and fragmentation occurs. Focusing systems differ depending on the shockwave generator used. Electrohydraulic systems use the principle of the ellipse. A metal ellipsoid directs the energy created from the spark gap electrode. In piezoelectric systems, ceramic crystals arranged within a hemispherical dish direct the produced energy toward a focal point. In electromagnetic systems, the shock waves are focused with either an acoustic lens, the Siemens system, or a cylindrical reflector, the Storrs system. The third component in lithotripsy is the coupling mechanism. In the propagation and transmission of a wave, energy is lost at interfaces with differing densities. As such, a coupling system is needed to minimize the dissipation of energy of a shock wave as it traverses the skin surface. The usual medium used is water as this has a density similar to that of soft tissue and is readily available. In first generation lithotriptors, the Dornier HM3, the patient was placed in a water bath. 
However, with second and third generation lithotripters, small water-filled drums or cushions with a silicone membrane are used instead of large water baths to provide air-free contact with the patient's skin. This innovation facilitates the treatment of calculi in the kidney or ureter, often with less anesthesia than that required with first-generation devices. And the last component of the lithotripsy machine is localization systems. Introduced imaging systems are used to localize the stone and to direct the shock waves onto the calculus, as well as to track the progress of treatment and to make alterations as the stone fragments. The two methods commonly used to localize stones include fluoroscopy and ultrasonography. Fluoroscopy, which is familiar to most urologists, involves ionizing radiation to visualize calculi. As such, fluoroscopy is excellent for detecting and tracking calcified or otherwise radio-opaque stones, both in the kidney and the ureter. Conversely, it is usually poor for localizing radiolucent stones, for example, uric acid stones. To compensate for this shortcoming, intravenous contrast can be, or more commonly, cannulation of the ureter with a catheter and retrograde installation of contrast, that is, retrograde pilography, can be performed. Ultrasonographic localization allows for visualization of both radio-opaque and radiolucent renal stones and the real-time monitoring of lithotripsy. Most second-generation lithotripters can use this imaging modality, which is much less expensive to use than radiographic systems. Although ultrasonography has the advantage of preventing exposure to ionizing radiation, it is technically limited by its ability to visualize ureteral calculi typically due to interposed air-filled intestinal loops. In particular, small stones may be difficult to localize accurately. Let's see how the lithotripsy machine works. Extracorporeal means outside the body. You will put on a hospital gown and lie on an exam table on top of a soft, water-filled cushion. You will not get wet. You will be given medicine for pain or to help you relax before the procedure starts. You will also be given antibiotics. When you have the procedure, you may be given general anesthesia for the procedure. You will be asleep and pain-free. High-energy shock waves, also called sound waves guided by X-ray or ultrasound, will pass through your body until they hit the kidney stones. If you are awake, you may feel a tapping feeling when this starts. The waves break the stones into tiny pieces. The lithotripsy procedure should take about 45 minutes to one hour. A tube called a stent may be placed through your back or bladder into your kidney. This tube will drain urine from your kidney until all the small pieces of the stone pass out of your body. This may be done before or after your lithotripsy treatment. Let's end the video with the types of lithotripsy. The two types of lithotripsy are extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, ESWL, and laser lithotripsy. Laser lithotripsy is sometimes abbreviated as FERSL, flexible ureteroscopy and laser lithotripsy because doctors use a tool called a ureteroscope. Both procedures can help eliminate bothersome stones quickly and effectively. The type of treatment a doctor recommends will depend on a range of factors such as the type of stones and the individual's overall health. Let's learn about ESWL type lithotripsy. ESWL uses shock waves to break down stones. During this procedure, a surgeon will use a machine called a lithotripter to aim sound waves directly at the stones through the body. The sound waves break down the stones into small pieces. The waves only affect stones and will not harm muscle, bone, or skin. The procedure takes about one hour and usually takes place in a hospital. In most cases, a person can go home the same day. After the treatment, a person should pass the stone particles over several days or weeks through urination. And at last, Fersal type lithotripsy. This procedure involves using an endoscope to treat stones in the ureter. An endoscope is a flexible tube with a light and camera that helps a doctor see inside an organ or body cavity. The doctor can see the stones using the endoscope and uses a laser to break them down. The procedure takes about 30 minutes and most people can go home the same day. The broken stone fragments should pass easily through urine in the days and weeks following the procedure. This was the simplified video on the lithotripsy machine. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.